In keeping with our new tradition to present a student as a keynote speaker, we conducted a nationwide search, screened a large number of highly skilled and talented candidates ranging in age from high school seniors through the graduate studies level. After that exhaustive search, we are pleased to present tonight Ms. Sophia Porter. Sophia, she deserved that. Sophia is a senior at Hyman Brand Hebrew Academy in Overland Park, Kansas. She is aspiring to study astrophysics and physics in college. Her impressive list of awards and honors include winning the Center for Advanced Professional Studies Innovator of the Year for developing an application in partnership with Children's Mercy Hospital. In addition to serving as tonight's keynote speaker, the Space Club is providing Sophia with a $10,000 scholarship to help her pursue her education. <laughs> Sophia clapped for that part. I bet her parents clapped for that part, too. Please help me in welcoming tonight's keynote speaker, Ms. Sophia Porter. originally planned for today is not the one you're going to hear. As I was beginning my outline, I ran into an identity crisis. You see, I had turned to the internet for a synonym of the word scientist, and I, no I noticed that some sources said the opposite of scientist was artist. I would like to clarify that normally I'm not one to challenge well-established thesauruses, but Art and science happen to be my two biggest passions. I thought, how is it that the two things I plan on spending the rest of my life pursuing are opposites of one another? Suddenly, I had become a walking paradox. I threw my first speech out the window. This issue had to be resolved. Let me start with the source of my own inspiration, which I received when I was only 10 years old. It's sitting on my bookshelf at home, right between the glacier picture book and the lightning picture book. And it's called Cosmos, a field guide. The cover features a magnificent picture of the Sombrero Galaxy. And from the moment I opened it, I was addicted. Moons, planets, stars, nebulae, and galaxies. Each category magnificent and vivid and colorful, each with its own mind-bending description. Jupiter's moon Io particularly captured my affection. Io is cratered, volcanic, and toxically sulfuric. Its surface is speckled with vivid yellows, reds, and greens. That a planet so radically foreign and so beautiful could exist in the universe, let alone in my cosmic neighborhood. I mean, wow. <laughs> and I could dream for hours about the Crab Nebula, its vibrant, dusty veins resemble something out of a sci-fi movie. In fact, I loved the Butterfly Nebula so much that one night, when my family was asleep, I painted it in a massive mural on a wall in my house. <laughs> Thank you. It's still there today. When people ask about it, I enjoy explaining that the nebula's wings are actually dust that is pulled off of one star by its binary companion, then ejected into space by solar winds. My parents' reaction, seriously, Sophie? <laughs> Again? <laughs> Reflecting on my Cosmos book and mural made my paradox even worse. Did I love the pictures because they were beautiful or because I was amazed by what they portrayed? A few weeks ago, I brought up the problem to my uncle, who shares my interest in physics. He chuckled. You've received national recognition for your writing and painting, which makes you an artist in my book, he said. But I've never met an artist who listens to astrophysics lectures while she paints. <laughs> it's definitely an unusual combination. I asked him whether he thought artistic vision could improve science. 
You never want to introduce creativity or interpretation into science, he said. Science and art are two very different things. In my mind, I had to disagree. For the next few days, I kept thinking back to my uncle's point in the context of my career aspirations. I want to be a theoretical astrophysicist. They can't exactly manipulate matter like chemists or travel to observe their subject like biologists. They deal with the end of data where there's limited observable evidence. When you don't have much material to begin with, how can you get more without being creative and making a hypothesis? And could a science so focused on symmetry be the polar opposite of art? It just doesn't seem possible to me, especially because art can actually play a part in science outreach, too. Let me explain. Two years ago, I attended a four-week physics program at the University of Pennsylvania over the summer. The director, Mr. Bill Berner, taught my class about the principle of simultaneous fall, that a ball rolled off a table and a ball dropped from the same height will strike the ground simultaneously. The ball's horizontal velocity doesn't change its vertical acceleration. Now that's all very jargony, and I had just finished my second year of high school. I hadn't actually taken a course in physics before. The concept didn't hit home until Mr. Berner fired a blow dart across the room, triggering the release of a stuffed monkey suspended at the same height. Same principle, different props. The blow dart embedded itself in the monkey, proving that although one had horizontal velocity, both fell at the same rate. Maybe you could argue that it doesn't matter how Mr. Berner taught this lesson, because the takeaway is the same. But I think there's something more to it. Why else, before blowing the dart, would Mr. Berner have put on a safari hat? <laughs> At some point, the lesson crossed into the territory of performance art. And it worked, because I still vividly remember it. In fact, a consequence of Mr. Berner's theatrics and creativity is that I didn't just learn, I was inspired. And that's so much more powerful than just knowing facts. At its core, the source of my inspiration lies in that unique art-science combination. My painting could stand alone as a piece of art, scientific background aside, and so could Mr. Berner's performance. But science helps them both to tell stories, and that's what makes them so compelling. So here's a question I'm sometimes asked. Why did I create that mural of the Butterfly Nebula? Because it's visually appealing or because of the explanation behind it, the binary star system? Quite honestly, I think the best answer is yes. People love to look at the picture on the wall, but the best part is that they're motivated to ask about its story. And the art of creating a story really is the key to outreach. Mr. Berner made simultaneous fall compelling by adding theatrical suspense. Could he shoot the monkey? My painting has a story, a meaning, simply because of what it represents. In October, I attended a campout with the Astronomical Society of Kansas City, where I learned about a new form of storytelling, astrophotography. I began mapping out constellations in my mind, picking out Andromeda and the center of the Milky Way in the sky. I spent four nights with my camera pointed at the stars and headed home that Sunday with images of Andromeda, the Orion Nebula, and the Pleiades. Was I engaged in art by capturing something beautiful or in science by studying space? What I've come to find is that that's a trick question. Art and science are like lenses to me. Wear them together, one over each eye, and they transform the world into a 3D masterpiece. When you get someone to look up at the night sky, or admire the layers of the Grand Canyon, or the diversity of a lush forest, just because they're beautiful, you've taught them an intro lesson in science. Maybe you're even inspiring them to learn more about astronomy, geology, or biology. It could be studying an image, or observing Mr. Berner equipped with a blow dart, acting as a monkey hunter. It could be listening to harmonious and discordant pitches to learn about the physics of sound waves. The goal, ultimately, is to help everyone find their own 3D glasses. And that's a goal for all of us. Someone or something inspired you to join the aerospace field. Share that spark with a student and be their inspiration. It may not be apparent for a week or a decade, but my Cosmos book taught me that sometimes it's the smallest nudge that makes the biggest difference. 
I would like to thank the Space Club for providing me with the opportunity to share my inspiration. And mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, and my brother Joe, thanks for your constant support. To my uncle Joel, who disagreed with me about the definition of science, thanks for a lot of thought-provoking conversations. Thank you, Mr. Haas, my head of school, for coming from Kansas City to be with me this evening. And finally, Mr. Berner, who is sitting in the audience right now, thank you for helping me to see the world in 3D for the first time. It's my goal to pass that on. Which leads us back to my paradox, the misguided definition of artist as an antonym of scientist. Art, I have found, really is a pillar of science research and outreach, which is why theoretical astrophysics is so appealing to me. Your industry has inspired me to search for the answers to big questions. Your work has paved the path for my generation to connect more and more of the universe's puzzle pieces, discovering compelling ideas in science and art and even philosophy along the way. Ultimately, through this realization, I have solved my existential crisis. I'm not a paradox at all, and that's evident in the art of the universe. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. You inspire us with your energy and your fresh perspective.